you know, as a poet, I've, I've, I've kind of, st I've started writing again and especially writing about body stuff. And we're normally, I would see the engagement a lot with if it's my face or if it's my, you know, my body, but I was just posting these, um, you know, just different slides of a poem I wrote. And it was like the highest engagement that I'd gotten in like, you know, four months. And it was really because it was authentic. It was me and talking about my experience and being really honest about that. So we're going to dig all into authenticity today. We have Mary Lambert here with us. Yeah. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. It's co so cool. So happy to have you here. I would love for you to introduce yourself to our audience. You are a multi-hyphenate to the fullest extent. So um, <laughs> I'd love for you to just share with everyone all of those different hyphens that you identify with. Yeah, absolutely. I started out as a as a spoken word artist, so poetry was really the foundation of the work I did. And then I collaborated with Macklemore, and we wrote the song "Same Love." Um, and then, so that's primarily, I think, how most people know me. But I started doing a lot of other side work. So I do some voice acting. I was in yeah. Netflix's yeah. show yeah. I Love Arlo and the movie Arlo. And I've been doing some film scoring and composition. And I've also been really active in like fat activist spaces, queer activism. I feel like a real calling to, to be active in all of those spaces. And so finding like a common thread between all of those things for me has just been about like vulnerability and really being okay with accepting myself as like a full complex human being and creator that like it's okay if the different things that I share online don't like people might know me in different capac capacities but it's okay because it's me you know absolutely and we've heard so much today already how people want to connect with you oh, wow. and one in our first panel Ben Burns said people follow people right mm -hmm. and people are 360 degrees and so I love um, that um, you really lean into showing up in that way and um, when the pandemic hit and the music industry essentially stopped existing mm -hmm. how did your identity shift as a creator and and what was the impact on how you approached content creation? I think I specifically saw myself as somebody that just made art. I didn't really see myself as um, having like a teachable skill. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I was like, I have no certifications. <laughs> like, like, who am I to, to show up and just, you know, it was a lot of imposter syndrome, I think, when I first was trying to figure out what to build and what to start. Mm -hmm. And I thought about, you know, maybe teaching stuff about music or art because I was home. I had just built my home studio here and I was doing a lot of, I was doing voice acting and recording, but again, I just felt like my calling and what I was really being pushed to do was just talking about body shame and body liberation. So much of the poetry that I've written is about, you know, is about trying to feel at home in your body. And so I found that as the pandemic hit, more people were feeling, they were feeling more combative in their own relationships with their bodies. And I thought, you know what, I've been doing body liberation stuff internally for 10 years now. And whenever I show up on stage, like seeing pop songs in a crop top and as a fat person, like it seems to be like groundbreaking for a lot of people, but it's just like my daily life. So what can I offer other people? How can this be like a helpful symbiotic relationship? And would people want to learn like different methods of trying to love yourself, you know, throughout all of this? So I really buckled down and spent about, I would say I probably spent two or three months researching and then three months building the course so I could do it with synchronous classes. And it's been like, it's been absolutely life-changing and it was really successful. And I was really blown away about the interest and, um, and also it sort of continued um, yeah. interest. So to me that shares that there's like an evergreen value in, um, you know, mental health stuff and caring for yourself and 
Yeah. I love it. I think that the vulnerability and even just deciding, okay, I want to teach, like I'm not just creating content, but I, I want to educate people on something and I don't necessarily have the certification, but I do have my own experience. Is that enough? Yeah. And then not just, is that enough, but can I actually sell this to the community that I've built today? So when you started gearing up to promote your course and put it out there to the community that's been following you. Hey, I'm, I'm starting to do this thing. Kind of what was the mental gymnastics that you had to go through with that? And then ultimately, what was the response that you saw from your community? So my partner is a professor. <laughs> my spouse is, a, is an English professor. They're like the director of composition at their university. And I'm just inspired. I, I originally, I was applying to graduate school to be a music teacher when I got the call to do Same Love. So I've, in my bones, have always felt like I'm supposed to teach. I taught private lessons for, you know, for piano and voice and cello. And I had never, I had never had a chance to really flex that muscle or try something different. Mm -hmm. And I was anxious at first of what the response would be mm -hmm. from my fan base, that they knew me this one very particular way. And what are they going to think of me? Are they thinking I'm just like hawking something, you know, to, you know, I, I, I want, I wanted it to feel like they were going to be able to get a lot for what I was asking uh, um, for the fee. You know what I mean? Um, and I noticed anytime I talked about the workshop, the engagement really wasn't there, but I found that I really needed to establish my ethos. So I decided there's really not, it's, it's not really beneficial to be like, to pull people in by saying, you should be scared of this and this is bad and this is bad. Don't do this. Come here, you know, like, and I'll teach you da, 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 da. What I wanted to show was like, I started posting photos of my body, my unencumbered body, you know, my stomach just as it is, which I never, never would have been able to do, you know, five or six years ago without the work and without the, you know, really concentrated effort to love my body as it is. I wouldn't have been able to do that without that work. So I wanted to show myself as evidence of this work and it was very much like showing, not telling. And those photos became something really powerful and meaningful to a lot of people to see somebody my size and my stomach hanging out and being like, how is she doing that? How is she comfortable doing that? And I didn't, I'm, I posted it not, you know, I didn't feel a sense of shame. I didn't feel like it was being brave. It's just my body. But I wanted other people to feel comfortable enough to where they could do that as well. And so I got to sort of illustrate the benefits of the workshop um, by doing that rather than being like, and in this workshop, you're going to get da 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 da. I really being able to establish that I am maybe I don't have certifications in particular things, but body shame isn't really like, like there's, it's difficult to get certified in, you know, deconstructing body shame. Um, so. But I have, I have a wealth of lived experience and being, you know, a fat person in the public eye somewhat and, you know, having my weight be picked apart at every turn for me felt like a very good certification <laughs> license or I'm sure for, for moving forward. <laughs> of, of, of life, life experience. Yes. Yeah. I've dealt with it directly. And, and so I also think when it comes to getting ready to teach or leaning into that teaching muscle, there's fear around like, what can I teach? Right. Oh, and how do I want to teach? There's a lot of different ways to use it. And I think you kind of created your own unique way of teaching, leveraging our platform. Can you share a little bit how you've set that up? Yeah, I I felt like I was like hacking into the main. I don't, I don't, I didn't, but I realized that's <laughs> not, you don't want to say that. But I, I, what I wanted to do, I wanted to make sure that when people join the workshop, they're getting me and I wanted it to be a really like live feeling like we're all in a class together. So. But what I've done is I use the coaching platform and I have different options as people can sign up for 
coaching, but it is a synchronous class with, you know, I think the last enrollment I had was like 150 people. So having people show up for these synchronous classes and um, we do exercises within the class while class is live. And then I assign sort of these suggested readings, um, different ways to think about your body or different ways to approach, you know, all of the stuff. And then, um, and then I have a Facebook group that sort of is another place where people can discuss. Um, And then I email everybody the outline on Mondays, and then we all attend class on, you know, Tuesday or Sunday or something. And I've I found it really uh, really helpful <laughs> to be able to have everything in one spot. So I've I've loved it. I love it. I I think the thing that I'm most excited about this summit is to hear all of the different ways creators are using my using the platform because it blows my mind on a <laughs> on a daily basis. And so thank you for sharing kind of like the back end of how you've you've set everything up. Mm-hmm. Leaving a little bit more back into that authenticity conversation, I think the other side of show up, be vulnerable, um, let people know kind of the nuanced experience that you're having. On the flip side of that. It can be really draining um, and exhausting to share so much. Yeah. So how have you kind of navigated building boundaries um, inside of your content creation to ensure that like it's still authentic and true to you, but there are still things that you've kept for yourself or you're, you're still protecting your own energy, peace, whatever it may be. Totally. I mean, I think it's no, uh, I think it's no secret that like social media can be really f- exhausting and really draining mm-hmm. and I find myself, you know, with like bloodshot eyes at like three in the morning being like, what disaster is happening now? Like everything's falling apart. Mm -hmm. And I also, as a like a recovering perfectionist, I think I have a really hard time posting content without having like gone over it with a fine tooth comb over and over again. And I think, you know, in some ways, I think mostly and like 90% of that is really rooted in the desire to be compassionate and empathetic and mm-hmm. really like have a commitment to intersectionality in my work and be like, if I'm saying this, how can this be interpreted? Like, what are the, how, how would this be heard by somebody else who isn't my identity? And I think that's a really, I think people should do that. I think it should, I think you should give a shit, you know, <laughs> like, I think it, it should matter. Um, but I think you definitely don't want it to get to the point where you're so it's so debilitating that you don't cr- create anything at all. And you don't, you know, you don't share what's going on for you at all. Um, but also making sure that it's like actually beneficial for you. There are sometimes like, when I'm, you know, working on certain things that it just doesn't seem social media doesn't seem to have a very important pull to this whatever aspect of I'm that I'm doing um, and other things will surprise me too like you know as a poet I've 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 kind of st- I've started writing again and especially writing about body stuff and we're normally I would see the engagement a lot with if it's my face or if it's my you know my body but I was just posting these um, you know just different slides of a poem I wrote and it was like the highest engagement that I'd gotten in like you know, four months. And it was really because it was authentic. It was me and talking about my experience and being really honest about that. And I think that's scary, but it's also, it took time to make it. And I think, I think that's indicative of something deeper that when you have put a lot of care and thought into something, it's possible that people aren't going to notice it, but if it's good, like you, like if you're good at something, like take the time and slow down and make something that you're proud of that you can revisit and say, like, I'm really glad I did that. That really either like pushed me further in my own growth or like it brought people, you know, joy or something, you know, like I got to be a steward of this experience for somebody else through just being authentic and honest. And in that way, you can't lose. You can't lose, you know? Whereas if I'm, if I'm just trying to quickly put out, you know, socials at the right time at like, you know, like making sure that I get the, you know, whatever the algorithm is, I start, it makes me feel 
it makes me feel panicky. But I also want to want to acknowledge that, like, I I feel like I come into the space with a bit of privilege. Like, it's not I don't rely on it entirely for my income, and and it's like a part of my income. Um, and I have the ability to like turn down partnerships and things like that if they don't really suit my needs or wh- how I how I you know want to walk through social media with you know yeah and I think that's for business owners can be really challenging when it feels like social media is that kind of main driver of like here's how I'm gonna grow here's how I'm gonna get my new clients or yeah. the, the new students to my courses and 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 however that is. And I think the fact that you grounded your community in uh, your sense of creation versus inside of like, here's this thing that I can sell you. You've kind of been able to create this separation of my social space gets to be a space where I do get to explore and experiment and create and throw things out there and, and see how it goes. And then get in, but you have been able to get in there and say, oh, and I have this thing and I think it would be a value to you and, and mm-hmm. you should try it out. Do you feel like as you proceed to grow your courses and, and build out kind of the different offerings that you, you want to create, how do you plan to kind of bring your community along in that experience with you? Mm. Hey, that's such a good question because I really, really value the people that have signed up for my workshop and that have done this work for me, I get to know them pretty intimately. And I feel like I would, I've been able every cycle of the workshop. So I've ran the workshop about eight different times through different cycles. And every time I feel like I'm able to pull something more based on feedback that I've received from, you know, from the workshop. And I also like engage with people in the Facebook group or like I try to even like email people if I have time, you know, Mm -hmm. and because of, because this work is so, it's also so community based and it's also about uh, people's like lived experiences. It's important to be able to facilitate more than like be an authority of something. I want people to be able to build their own communities. I think when I was feeling really isolated, especially like when the pandemic first hit, I was like, man, I don't know anybody around me. I don't know this community. And like, I would actually, I miss that. What if I can build that kind of space online? Um, And so part of the workshop is like people, people being able to talk amongst themselves in Zoom rooms, you know, (laughs) and like meet other people from similar experiences. And like being able to facilitate that has been super, super important. And I, you want that trust, you know, I want people to trust me that I'm going to be a good cheesecloth for nuggets of wisdom and bring them into, you know, the other side of body shame. And yeah, it's been, it's just been really, really empowering. I feel like I absolutely did not answer your question. (laughs) No, um, you were you were speaking to kind of how you are already involving the community in the Mm -hmm. building of your future resources that you're going to provide. And I think that hits on such a valid point of like, how are you taking learnings from what you've already created to build with your ideal customer or community member uh, in mind, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And I think too, every, every iteration of the workshop, like this last one I did, I was like thinking, man, I really want to start with some sort of entry point about how we treat other people and how we look at other people and judge other people because so much people enter the space usually wanting to do a lot of internal work and say, I want to love my body the way I am, but we don't usually flip the lens over to say, how am I viewing other people's bodies? Am I being critical of other people's bodies when I'm around, you know, different kinds of people and being able to really be reflective about that of like, if I'm being critical of other people, of course, I'm going to be critical of myself. So, I mean, there's just all of these different ways that you can incorporate different iterations of, you know, lessons or feedback you get. And I, yeah, I try to engage as much as possible with that, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love it. And I think, uh, 
when it comes to whether it's building the curriculum for your course or figuring out what's this next video that I'm going to create, all of that pulling from mm -hmm. what you're hearing from your community members is how you also lean on that authenticity that isn't always coming from you. You don't always have to be the catalyst for it. Once you do have that community, you can lean on them to drive it a little more. Um, I did see a question in the chat that I wanted to flag of how did you decide pricing for your course and how has that or for your workshop and how has that evolved over the the process of um, iterating on the workshop or, or how you're thinking about your future offerings? That's such a good question. I think pricing is really tough. Um, it's something I've really struggled with because I definitely I'm somebody that <laughs> in the past has been like, I will take what I can get. Um, and I think so often, especially as like, people have been socialized as you know, women and, you know, fat people, queer people, anybody that's like on the margins, you're like, I will just, I'm just glad to be here. And, and uh, you, you know what, do you want $50? I will give you $50. You know what I mean, like, it's really difficult to like, really establish yourself and feel like, okay, what do I, what do I actually bring to the table? Like, what is, what is my value? And that's really, it's so hard to look in the mirror and be like, I am worth this much money. <laughs> you know? Like you have to see it as like, this is not, this is not an indicator of my worth or value as a person, but it's what do I bring to the table and what are they really getting out of this? I wanted it to be, you know, a pretty competitive rate. I looked at, uh, I just kind of Googled like body positive workshops and saw how much other people were charging. And a lot of the time I was like, oh my God, it's so much money. But I was also like, well, they have, you know, they have um, certifications and like degrees and my degree is in music and it's not, it's not relevant to this thing that I am, I am offering. So what would be, what would be competitive for me and what I bring to the table? So I kind of broke it down by um, by time spent, like how much labor was really put into um, each of these things. If it was something I slapped together, you know what I mean? If I just do something very quickly, I probably, I don't think I would charge that much for it. But because the workshop is so much of my time, and if I'm thinking about it, I'm like, this is taking me away from, you know, scoring work that I could be doing, you know, you know, recording other other pursuits that do yield a good income so what would that sort of equivalent be what makes sense and what would people be willing to pay and can i offer discounts can i offer you know coupons for for people that have really said i'm i'm on board with everything you do mary <laughs> like i will do it you know and pe so i i try to reward people that are on my newsletter um, that are on my patreon and make it a, a process where it feels like they're they're getting a deal. And in a lot of ways, I feel like they are. <laughs> like I I try to I try to price it in a way that and I also do the pay over time option, I think has been really helpful for people feeling like, okay, that makes sense to me. I want people to go to the page and not be like, she's she's trying to charge. She's this is a, this is a, this is scammy. You know what I mean? I don't want people to go that far. But I also don't want to, you know under cut my own value. I've done that so much in my life. So I'm, tr I've been trying to be better about it. And like, for example, this, this next cycle of the workshop, I was like, normally I offer a discount on one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to offer a discount on one-on-one -on -one coaching. It is like, I really, I really enjoy doing it. And I really, I really put my all into it. And I'm present with this one single person for, you know, X amount of time. And, and so I'm not going to do a discount on that. So I think it's really about what are your priorities? How much labor are you doing? And being able to price yourself in a way that is fair to your audience, what people will pay, and what is going to be sustainable for you. And if it's not immediately sustainable for you, that's okay, it can be a, like a component of the work that you do. And you also, you know, owe it to yourself and your audience to prove your ethos online to show like y you are, it, you're getting a deal from me because of X, Y, and Z, because I'm so established in this, in the specific way, or because I bring this kind of knowledge. And I think that's the, that's the 
hopeful, really positive transaction where it doesn't, it feels like everybody's winning. That's what I think ultimately you want. Absolutely. I think that there's that fine line that you walk between like, I need to detach my sense of self-worth and value from this thing, but I also need to honor my value and my worth. And I think that process of breaking down like, okay, how many hours am I putting into this thing? Um, If I were to view myself as a contractor putting in the work to build this thing, what would I charge for that? And then back into a price from there to start. Mm -hmm. And then you're not locked into a price if that's the first price that you set. You can adjust from there. And I think another great opportunity is to survey the people who engaged with the content or took the course or joined the workshop and say like, hey, realistically, based on the value that you got, what would you have been willing to pay for this? And then leverage that as an insight to drive like, okay, well, other people have said um, that this is worth that. And and you can build from there, which I think is another way to kind of like reach outside of yourself for the insights you need for pricing. Totally. I think it's funny because I, you know, I started, I was working three jobs right out of college. I was working two jobs while I was in college. And I remember when, when I, when we started performing Same Love and when it started being on the radio, I was still bartending at the time. And I got asked to sing at weddings and I was like, oh my God, this is a huge step. I'm going to be able to do music, like maybe even full time. And I remember this feeling of like, I don't, how the fuck am I going to charge? Like, how much do I charge? I'm singing one song. They want me to sing one song. I don't have to travel for it. Like, I can't imagine. I'm like, okay, that's for an hourly rate. Like $300 is like a lot. That's a lot for an hourly rate. But like now in retrospect, I'm like, Mary, you could have charged so much more. And I remember I, I charged this, this couple in Seattle that were very, (laughs) they were very clearly wealthy. And I, I charged them like $300 and the woman handed me a check and she like, it was like three times as much. And she goes, you need to be charging more. And I, I was just flabbergasted. I was like, why would she say that? This is so much money. But I think also like, if you don't come from money and you don't like have an, an accurate idea of like, what are, what are like other people's income that are not like really struggling? Like it's, it's difficult to know. And I think conversely like if you come from like money or you have are accustomed to a very specific kind of you know income it's really difficult to understand pricing because it's like how do most people live and I remember just being like you know overdrafting every day and like barely you know I also had you know a lot of I had a lot of issues Um, but I just remember thinking like I don't know what I was supposed to charge but yeah that so that is it's a difficult process but I think familiar familiarizing, familiarizing yourself with the, you know, with the market, right? (laughs) Certainly. Absolutely. There, there are definitely a a bunch of ways to approach it. Um, There's another comment in the chat around like, how do you deal with comments from detractors or like negative comments? Uh Um, The comment section on the internet can be really the, the wild, wild west. So how over time have you found strategies to either disengage, ignore, respond, kind of what's what's your approach there? I've gone through a bunch of different phases. So when I first started, I was on Capitol Records and they were really, I mean, I was on, my team was Katy Perry's project team. So it felt like they were really pushing me into the sphere. And I was like, I am mentally dis- <laughs> I have a mental disorder. (laughs) Like I can't, I can't do, I can't do this. And I remember the feeling of when I released Body Love, which was a poem about body image. And I had emails pouring in every day, probably about 50 emails a day from people in, you know, recovery for, from eating disorders, from people who are, you know, maybe just starting to see themselves as, you know, a worthy, valuable human being. And they were so moving. I mean, people just like pouring their hearts out to me. And I felt, I felt like it's hard not to develop a bit of a savior complex around it to be like, look at all this good I'm doing with my platform. And aren't I just like the greatest? Um, And I found that as I was taking that home, anytime there was criticism, I also had to take that home. So when I was getting a lot of praise on Twitter or social media, it was feeling really like it was feeling really good. Like I'm good. I'm so good at this. And then I had a person, this is a trigger warning for self-harm. I had a person on Twitter 
continue to reach out to me and tweet me and say, you know, if you don't respond to me, I'm going to harm myself. If you don't do this, I'm going to harm myself. And then I remember one night they said that and attached photos of, of what they had done. And I was devastated. I mean, I was like, I was devastated for like a week. I, I couldn't, I felt responsible. And it occurred to me then that like, I'm not responsible for anyone's feelings. If I, if I, if the work that I do creates a catalyst for someone else's healing or a different way of thinking or approaching their life, that's awesome. But I can't take ownership of someone's choices. Um, and that was probably like my first, my first foray <laughs> into not taking other people's shit. And I've gone through different challenges and, you know, epiphanies from then. Um, but one thing I, I, that really changed my way of thinking as well was, it was a post that Sonia Renee Taylor made a couple months ago, maybe a couple years ago. God, I can't remember. But basically her, her, her video, her post was about saying, when people comment or reach out to me for, to ask me about X, Y, Z or whatever happened, or if I'm not doing enough, the internet is not my community. Instagram is not my community. I don't owe you anything. I don't, I owe my community something, but I don't, I don't owe Instagram. This is not a community here. You know what I mean? And I think that was really powerful to be like, holy cow. It's, it's, this isn't, this is a platform. It's a utility. So who are the people that I really want to be accountable to? And who are the people that are just, or maybe just pissed about something else, you know? So I try to be really cognizant of when I'm reading feedback, is it relevant to my journey and the message that I want to, you know, I want to put forward? Mm -hmm. And I'm also not, I'm not the government. I'm not a, I'm not a utility. I'm not a, I'm not a public, you know, I'm not a basketball court. I'm not, I'm, I am me and I'm, it's okay for me to delete stuff. It's okay for me to not engage with it. I don't owe anybody that. And I think for the longest time I felt like, no, I want the marketplace of ideas on my page and I want to, you know, have feedback with people. But I'm like, life is way too short for my blood pressure to be high. Like I'm not, I'm not looking forward. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to have that Facebook argument that goes on and I keep checking back and I feel, you know, I want to win, you know, anything that isn't pushing me towards creating a more beautiful future for everybody that is inclusive is not part of my journey. And it is, it will distract me from that. And I also think that there are some people online, I think there, Alok does this and I, I totally like, I think it works perfectly for them, but engaging with a negative comment and then pulling it out. I've done it a few times to be like, this is why this is categorically cruel or categorically wrong. Um, and I think that can be really beneficial in some ways, but I think it also, for me, I have noticed that it encourages a sort of a, a critical eye on the comments to say, you know, oh, you're going to, you're going to pull attention to that. But so why would I ever comment something positive? Because you don't engage with it, Mary. And I want to encourage positive engagement, not critical engagement. <laughs> critical if it's, if it is in service of a more inclusive, beautiful world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a, a journey that I think is is wrapped up in our identity as well, which is ever evolving. So kind of how you respond to it is gonna probably reflect kind of where you're at with, with your energy and your resolve around that. So I'm curious kind of the entire theme of our summit is the future. Um, so create the future. So how are you kind of thinking about the future of your world that you've created, your content what does that look like for you i it's so it is because it, it's exactly where i am i am i really feel like for the longest time and i feel like i tried to say this earlier i don't know if i said it articulately enough that i felt like part of the work i was doing was always i was i felt like i was consistently drawing attention to things that were wrong about the world that were wrong about the way people viewed themselves or wrong about dieting or wrong about, you know, whatever. 
And I started having this feeling of exhaustion of like, I, this is just, just the mental, man, the mental energy and the mental, the emotional stamina to just like wake up every morning and to be like, okay, I need to tell people about, you know, this and this and this, like these really like, you know, these painful, th and it's important. It's important to know where the crap is so that we can draw more attention to it if there's something actionable. Um, and sometimes awareness is all that you really can offer for something negative, you know, <laughs> for, I feel like I'm struggling here. What I'm trying to say is that I wanted to illustrate what is on the other side of shame? What's on the other side of tragedy and chaos? I grew up with a lot of violence in my home. What's on the other side of that? It's important to be vulnerable about the struggles you've experienced, but it's also okay. And I think probably more beneficial to say, this is what's on the other side of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like people are more drawn to that. They want, they want also to create things instead of like being all about like burn every fucking thing down, which in a way, like, and as an abolitionist, I'm like, yeah, burn everything down. Like we need, we need all new systems. <laughs> like all the systems are flawed, but also I want to be on the other side saying, what might that look like? Because there's a lot of people doing a great job saying, let's burn it down. I want to be part of this coalition that is saying, what could that possibly look like? What could health and wellness really look like for fat people that isn't, you know, solely based on weight loss or whatever, you know, like what, what might these things look like if it's surrounded by joy? And I think that started when I was, I started asking myself, what am I being motivated by in e even small decisions? Like, where do we want to go for lunch? What am I being, am I, am I scared to say the place I want to go because I'm scared you don't want to go? And, you know, it's like being able to be honest with your own needs is like requires that you know your own needs and that you are able to be honest about it. And I mean, this is like a microcosm, but I really think that it, it has allowed me to expand my consciousness <laughs> to be like, what is, what can I be what else can I be motivated by? Because the fear part of me is like making all the decisions right now. I want to make decisions from a point of joy. And what sacrifices am I willing to make? I, you know, I, the deals that I've turned down from social media have been pretty like substantial because I'm like, I don't, this, this company, like maybe offering me a bunch of money, but like, I know what they do to the to climate change. Like I know what they do to their labor force and I'm not comfortable with that. I have the luxury of being able to turn it down, but like, I want my audience to trust me. And that requires that I have a, com I uphold a commitment to them that I am going to be creating a beautiful world. And I want them to join me. And I, that doesn't work if I'm working with Nestle. You know what I mean? That doesn't work if I'm working with so-and-so. That means that like, I want to be I want to have integrity and authenticity as a through line, not just in my content creation, but in my life as a person. And then I, and that's the deal. Like I walk away, I win, you know, like I go on my hikes with the dogs or I go out to LA and do whatever. And I'm, I get to, I get to feel really good about where I'm at and like that I'm, I'm motivated by joy and and sharing that with other people i mean all of the snaps <laughs> all of the claps absolutely <laughs> everything about that and i think that the i think what you were speaking to was kind of the walls that you run into when you are constantly calling out the system right like it can be exhausting to look at this mountain of a problem and say like i don't even know how i can move forward because i'm so hyper aware of the monstrosity of a challenge that is so multifaceted that's in in front of us but when you get to create from joy when you get to kind of root yourself in what is honest and true for you and what's enough for you that's where you get 
at that opening for movement and growth and experimentation and all of that. And I think that's where we all want to be um, um, when it comes to building or creating or even consuming on the flip side as well. It can be totally. like very doom scrolly when you're seeing post after post after post um, that's negative versus new examples, new stories, mm -hmm. different identities, different experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that content creation has really created that lane and space for us. So totally. absolutely validate and honor everything mm -hmm. that you just shared and really appreciate uh, kind of, as you said, you got to show up in all of these different places in that way. And, and you absolutely showed up here in that way. And we're very, very appreciative to you there. And yeah, just want to say a big thank you. Thank you. I could just talk all day about, I know. about building <laughs> I a beautiful know. world. <laughs> I know. Well, Mary, thank you so, so much again for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Be oh, like no. very doom scrolly when you're seeing post after post after post um, that's negative versus new examples, new stories, exactly. different identities, different experiences. Oh, uh, and I think that content creation has really created that lane and space for us. So totally. absolutely validate and honor everything that you just shared and really appreciate uh, kind of, as you said, you got to show up in all of these different places in that way. And, and you absolutely showed up here in that way. And we're very, very appreciative to you. There. And yeah, Aww. just want to say a big thank you. Thank you. I could just talk all day about, I know. <laughs> about building I a beautiful know. world. <laughs> I know. Well, Mary, thank you so, so much again for joining us and we'll see you next time. 